Okay. Good afternoon. I'm Paul Foxworthy. I'm from Melbourne. We're talking a bit about the intersection between technology and politics. So my little project is a website, aupref.info, uh, a vain pun intended attempt to save or at least maybe improve Australian democracy with a little JavaScript. So thought for the day, graph is a tiny dollop of science that you can hold in your hand. So we've had a bit of visualisation during the conference and that's sort of what I've been trying to do as well. So that's the first dog on the moon comic strip that that's from. So here's the problem. Political parties are suggesting how we should vote. They're giving us guidance, suggestions and so on. And it can be hard for us to work it out for ourselves. The harder it is, the more likely we are, we are to throw our hands up and to say, it's all too hard, somebody make it simple for me. So if it is too hard for us to work it out for ourselves, then we don't. Which means that we're just doing what we're told by a political party, which has got obvious dangers. So there's the problem. So just a brief course on Australian elections, the voting system. If you want to look up something in Wikipedia to get a bit of detail about how our voting system works, the single transferable vote is the thing to look at. As you know, we number off preferences for candidates, one, two, three, four. Bottom-up preferences are distributed, so the lowest ranking candidate in the first preference, their preferences are distributed to other candidates and eventually we end up with somebody with a majority. In the Upper House and the Australian Senate, there's more than one member elected, so there's that same bottom-up process where uh, candidates that have got very low numbers of votes are eliminated and their preferences distributed. And there's also the top-down thing that if you have made enough votes to be elected to the Senate, then the leftovers are distributed. So if you meet a quota, then leftovers are distributed to other candidates. So a single transferable vote is the thing to look at to get more detail on that. In the Australian Senate and most of our states, there's now this above the line voting system where the parties submit a complete ticket. And what that means is they have pre-chosen the preferences for you. So we'll see in a second an example of a ticket from the Electoral Commission. You can see how that works. So voters could choose to say, yes, I will pick up and use that party's ticket. In other words, all of those preferences have been worked out for you ahead of time by a political party. So here's a picture from the Electoral Commission. You can see there that you've got the option of voting above the line. You just put a one in one box and the rest has been pre-decided for you by a political party. And you've also had the option of voting below the line where you can fill in all the boxes. In my state of Victoria, in council elections a couple of years ago, there was a problem I saw. So in one seat, one ward of my local council, there were 28 different candidates. Only there weren't. Really what there were was two, and there were a bunch of other candidates that were pushing a single issue button. So they said they were in favour of this or that, one thing, and what you needed to do to work out what was really going on was to look at their second preferences. And they're all feeding in. And there was maybe out of that 28, maybe one of them that had any sort of independence. For the rest, you could see, if you went to look at it, that really there were two clusters of candidates. To find out what was going on, you really needed to look at those second preferences. And I thought at the time, a couple of years ago, that if we had some way of visualising that, of communicating about that, we could make it clearer to people what was going on and perhaps get them to think more, more carefully about their vote. Similarly, in the Senate, we've got single issue button pushing micro party. So there's a couple of examples of them there. As our system works at the moment, we've got an incentive for tablecloth ballot papers. For if it's too big, too confusing, then more people are going to say, look, it's all too hard and vote above the line where it's at least simple for a voter to do. And the vast majority of Australian voters do vote above the line, which means they've handed over their choice of preferences to a political party. 
So the harder it is to vote below the line, the more likely it is that we vote above the line. So that's a genuine ballot paper. Somebody put this on Twitter. And that's not just one state. It was like this across Australia in the election recently. What's been happening is microparties often preference each other regardless of policy. So the theory is in the end one of them will get up and they're more likely to do that than to think about particular policy decisions. So as you know, as we've seen, we get a lottery. You get parties that start off with a very small number of votes ending up being elected to the Senate. And another real problem is that one person can be an officer for more than one party. So there was, during our last election, there was a, a situation where one person was submitting these tickets, working out preferences ahead of time for more than one political party, and we've seen the, the results of that. So I, for one, I'm, I'm not very pleased about that situation, and I would like things to be a bit different. So solutions that we could look at to these problems. Well, the first is to reform the system. There are a lot of people that have got some problems with the system that we have at the moment. And the other thing is better information, getting our, be getting our voters better informed about what their vote means, um, giving them the ability to think about that ahead of time. So you might not be aware of this, but we did have from December to May a Senate committee looking into this. And they came up with some recommendations, which I'd have to say overall are quite reasonable. You might argue with particular points, but if their recommendations are adopted, I think we'd be in a better place than we are right now. What they're proposing is to have optional preferences above or below the line. So typically, in a Senate election in Australia, you're electing six senators. That's half of the senators for your state at any one election, provided you've got six votes in there. It's the first six preferences, that's fine. That's a valid vote. And if you do vote above the line, you're expressing your own preference for parties. So the parties would no longer submit tickets. That's the proposal. That's the idea here. In all likelihood, a political party will have at least six candidates on their list. Provided they've done that, you can just number one box and that's a valid vote. And you can have optional preferences after that. And for me, I find when I'm looking at a Senate ballot paper and you're getting to, towards the last I don't know, quarter, or there's, there's some of them I really do not want to have my vote at all, and at the moment we're more or less obligated to give them a vote, so you don't have to anymore. At least that's the proposal. And as I've said, parties wouldn't submit tickets anymore. It was all shelved. In July it all went quiet, so they went to the trouble of having a Senate committee to look into this. So I think what's going on here is nobody wants to annoy Clive Palmer, and so it could be. One possibility is that the very last piece of legislation that gets passed by a current parliament is something to reform the Senate, but I don't know whether that'll happen because the Electoral Commission still needs like three months to gear up ahead of an election. So it's possible nothing will happen. So there was some thought given to this, perhaps some reasonable proposals for change, and it's all gone quiet. Maybe nothing will happen at all. In my state of Victoria, there was a review into local council elections, looking at some of these things that I've already been talking about. And there is a recommendation that candidates for council elections can't distribute how to vote information. There's a mail out to all voters, so they can't submit how to vote information, which may help address some of these issues. And if they are a member of some political party, they would need to say so. So there's been some thought on reforming the system. We're very close to a state election in Victoria and who knows after that, so a new government may actually implement these changes. So, for reforming the system, it's all very slow. Uh, nothing's going to happen right now. Maybe nothing will for a while. So the other thing to look at is better information to inform the voter. So this thing here, I had nothing to do with it. Belowtheline.org.au, you can see the two people that were responsible for it. Benno gave a great talk at the Linux conference in January in Perth. I've got the URL there at the end. I'll tell you how to get hold of the links out of these things so you don't need to write all of that down. Gave a great talk about it. So the idea of Below the Line is that you can visit the Below the Line website and it has a list of candidates and parties and it has links to policy statements 
for all of those parties. So you can think out ahead of time whether you like the policies for one party or another, and you can plan out your own how to vote card. So you can order candidates at your leisure, take a bit of time over it, look at policy statements, and you can walk into the polling booth with your own pre-printed how to vote card. So it's a very cool idea. I know many of you here, I'm sure, are already aware of it. Benno asked for a show of hands for people that had used this at the Linux conference in January, and the, the vast majority of people in the room had. So there's some awareness of this, and it is a great thing. Belowtheline.org.au, check it out. And the other thing that I wanted to do was, well, if only people had better information, if only they could see and visualise some of this stuff, maybe that might make a difference. It might make some difference. So I found these things, force-directed graphs. It's a very good way of communicating many-to-many -many relationships. There are several graphing libraries that provide force-directed graphs, and it's what I've built on for the work that I've done. So here's one example of a force-directed graph. These are characters out of Les Miserables. And the little lines are interactions between those characters. So there are obvious families and groups and clusters and so on. And when they talk to each other or interact with each other in the story, then that makes a line in the diagram. So there's example data around for this. So this is one example of a force-directed graph. So here's my thing. It's a website, aupref.info. If I can get to the web browser here. Okay, so what's happening here is, I'll show you a bit of the data in the moment. The data is freely available from the Electoral Commission. You can download it in CSV format. And what I'm doing is bringing the, the nodes, the dots, to represent political parties closer or further apart, depending on how closely they're preferencing each other. What we're seeing here at the moment is an overall survey. So it is what every party thinks of each other, I'm working on, and at some stage I will have the uh, ability to start with saying, well, let's just look at second and third preferences and grow out, uh, out of that. So what you would see at the beginning, if I was doing that, is you'd see islands of parties. Often, if parties are exchanging preferences, there'd be just two to start with. And if you increased it from there, saying, show me third, fourth, fifth level preferences, we might start to see connections between those islands. So this is an overall survey of who's preferencing who. If you float your mouse over any one of these, you can see that I'm numbering off from here the preferences for other parties. So you can see, in this case, the Australian Democrats, who their second, third, fourth preference is from here. So what we get when we look at this sort of thing, I don't know, can I scroll this? Yeah, beautiful. What we get when we look at this is we get parties closer together when they have some similar similarity in outlook when they're preferencing each other. So there are some interesting things to see here when you look at this sort of diagram. We've got, for instance, over here, we've got several over there that are, I don't know, libertarian parties. We've got, uh, there are several Christian parties that preference each other. Uh, we can see clusters of parties when they've got some similarity in outlook. So it's not always immediately obvious that if you're voting for the smokers' rights party here, that in fact the second preference is going to the Liberal Democrats. And if you had that little bit more knowledge and awareness, maybe you'd decide that you didn't want to vote for the smokers' rights party in the first place. So I'm trying to visualise this, trying to show people what the implications are, what it means for their votes. So that's aupref.info. That's the website for that. So here's a little bit out of the data. So it is CSV. You can get it from the Electoral Commission. One interesting thing to note here is the, the A's there are the columns across the ballot paper. So there are the Electoral Commission call them groups, political parties, and they're just column A, B, C, D. The number is really interesting. Parties can submit more than one ticket. Uh, 
they can submit two or three different tickets. So what that means is if you've chosen them above the line, or somewhere in the list of their preferences, there's a 50-50 chance or a one-third, one-third, one-third chance for where your preference is going to go. So not only are they, are they choosing your preferences ahead of time, they're also roll the dice about where your preference is actually going to go. So there are some political parties like, for instance, the Australian Democrats that have a long tradition of saying, well, we're not going to uh, make a decision for you about the two major parties, Liberal and Labor. Here are a few that we think are good, and after that you can choose which of the major parties that you want. And that's been embedded in our system. So parties can, and more than one party does, submit more than one ticket. So that's the one that you see there. For some of the parties down there, you'll see there's more than one, there are one and a two, and it's possible even to submit three different tickets. So that's there in the CSV data here. So you can obtain this from the Electoral Commission, freely available. So I want to make some general points about the technology that I've used here and uh, that we're seeing in this stuff. So 21st century graphs do the Harry Potter thing. They take advantage of the ability to make things move and change over time on a computer screen where if you're printing it on a piece of paper, then it's entirely static. The first thing I mention here, this data visualisation website. So that's a consultancy in Switzerland that does a lot of visualisation work and they've got a really nice list of tools. So if you're at all interested in this stuff, that's a nice place to start to get a survey of some of the things that are around. So in a second I'll say a little bit more about what I used for my little project, but that is an excellent place if you're interested in doing this sort of work. Now, the second thing I'm going to mention here, Gapminder. So you might have heard of this guy, Hans Rosling before, he's done TED Talks and so on. He's a well-known commentator on health and development and so on. So I'll go to the Gapminder website. And this is a, an example of what I was saying about movement in graphics and visualisation. So that one's Wealth and Health of Nations. Okay, now sadly this thing's written in Flash. I think that's a shame. There are, for this particular graph, there are examples using other things, using straight JavaScript and JavaScript libraries and so on. This thing's implemented in Flash, which is a shame. I think we're seeing the results of that right now. I'll give up on this in a moment if it doesn't come up. Check it out. I mean, the, the data is interesting. The presentation is interesting. Eh, I think I put in a screenshot. See this sort of thing? Yeah, I did. Okay, so we're not seeing it in action. But what we've got here, see the number 2012 there, that's the year, it plays out over time. So what happens is the dots on the graph move over time. So you can see trends and growth over time. Along the horizontal axis, it's income per person. Vertical axis is life expectancy. The colours are just regions of the world. You can see up in top right there's a little world map. The size of the dots are population. So when you play this thing out over time, things move. So there's an overall trend from towards the bottom left to towards top right. It's actually quite uh, gratifying that things are getting better when you start looking at this sort of evidence for the world as a whole. Things are getting better and by no means perfect but things are getting better. So that's an example of a graph that gives you movement and interaction that's possible. Now I want my presentation. There it is. The thing I use is this thing, D3. So it's a JavaScript library. JavaScript's not my favourite programming language, but I chose it because of this interactivity thing that we can, in a web page, if you, any modern web browser will be fine, you can see this thing, you can interact with it, you can work with it. It's open source, there's a BSD licence. One of the main authors of D3, Mike Bostock, does a lot of visualisation work for the New York Times, so you might have seen the results of some of his work there. We've actually seen D3 in action in the conference yesterday. So that talk late in the day about the humanities network, and we started with Dame Edna Everidge and click out from there, that was D3. There was a talk on visualising data for server performance, and there was the weather and so on that Katie did, and that was using a thing called Rickshaw, which builds on D3. So we've seen D3 in action, and it's quite cool, there's a lot of people using it. So 
I thought we'd get a bit to the technology. So here's a bit of the magic, the code behind it all. It's just JavaScript. If you prefer to use a CoffeeScript or whatever, that's absolutely fine. You could, plenty of people have. So I'm um, using D3 saying, okay, we want the force directed graph layout. There are other layouts you could use as well. D3 can be used for many other things, but it's got quite a nice force directed graph. So the charge thing here is repulsion. So my nodes, if I set a bit of charge, they'll bump into each other somewhat, but they won't overlap totally. Friction is how, how fast people move. With a force directed graph, it iterates and settles down in a configuration. The friction gives you some control over how fast or slow that goes. Gravity is to try and make sure that your nodes don't explode forever off the page. So gravity is keeping them contained somewhere in the middle of the page. You feed it your points for the force directed graph, your nodes, the dots on the graph, the circles in what I showed you before, and that's just a JavaScript array. You feed it an array of JavaScript objects. And you give it links, which are connections between those, so you have numbers for the different nodes, and in a link you're saying this is connected to that. And the key thing for me here to get my political parties closer together or further apart was setting a link distance. So the link distance is different for the different parties, for the different connections between them. And I've already said the second preference is really interesting. The data, I didn't say this, the data that I was using was from that Senate election in Western Australia that was done earlier this year, the, the rerun, the second one. And there were 38, if I remember rightly, parties in that. And it really doesn't matter much if you've preferenced 37 or 38, but it matters heaps if you've, pre if you've preferenced two or three. So I took the log of the preference number to try and do that, to try and say, okay, early on it's really important and that importance diminishes as we go further. So I have a little function, the code's all available, I'll tell you where to get it to see how I went about doing that. This is the key to the magic, this enter here. What I'm doing is saying, so this is the key thing about D3, that it's built on code, JavaScript objects, and it's built on elements on pages. So both HTML elements and scalable vector graphics, SVG. So my circles on the diagram, we're just using scalable vector graphics, AVG. So what I'm doing here is saying to D3 that I want to pick out everything that's got a normal CSS class attached, dot link, and there won't be any of those. And then I'm saying, here's the data, a JavaScript array, and what the enter does is build an element on the page corresponding to each of the objects in that JavaScript array. So you get binding, you get an element on the page that you can see that can be SVG and quite sophisticated, and you get an object behind the scenes with the relevant data. So similarly here for my nodes, and you noticed I did a little mouse over before and a node grew and I numbered off preferences, and that's just fairly typical JavaScript event handling here. We've got a mouse over and mouse out going on in here. So here's the result of the generated SVG. So an SVG line for a connection, an SVG G element, G for graphics, which has got stuff inside it, including, as you can see, a circle here. So the sort of code we saw before generated this sort of stuff in the page. So D3 is really cool. It's not an abstraction layer. It associates those JavaScript objects with elements on the page. So other things like rickshaw build on that and give you more of an abstraction layer if that's what you want. So I'd love pull requests. I'd love contributions. It can all be found out on Bitbucket. There's where to go for that. I've put an Apache license on this work. I'm very close to putting out on the website, focusing on where, uh, I call it a cluster, where a given party has received more than one second preference. So that's what I was complaining about in the council election recently, and there are some interesting examples of that in the Western Australian data as well. It's quite slow at the moment. Any JavaScript performance experts that have got any interest in this stuff, I'd be interested if you've got anything to say. So what next? Victorian elections coming up very soon. I only have, it's mid-November that the tickets will come out and I'll get that data up. There's a really interesting talk coming up on related stuff in January, the Linux conference in Auckland. So this guy, a lawyer, Michael Cordova, has been trying to get access to the source code for the software that distributes 
these preferences. It's an important issue for us as voters. It's uh, secret, closed source, and he's tried to use freedom of information to get access to it. So far, he hasn't succeeded. That will be an interesting talk. Just some resources on voting stuff in general. Again, I'll show you in a second where to get the slides so you can check out any of these if you're interested. The last one down the bottom there was a nice visualisation of the distribution of preferences from the 2010 election, if you want some information on how that works. Those images of microscopic creatures, that's the guy, a German naturalist, Ernst Haeckel. They're all out of copyright. The book that he wrote is over a century old. And this guy, Scott Draves, did some nice scans of these, and that's available under Creative Commons. D3 library I mentioned there, there's the Mike Bostock guy. So please give me feedback. The join, there's the joined in uh, with the talk number. So give me feedback on the talk, please. And if you want to pick up my slides and follow any of those links, that's where to go for that tiny URL slash AU prefs. OK, how long have we got? One minute for questions. Mm, one minute? OK, questions? Just tracing that first link if I could. The one um, before Gapminder. Okay. Uh, the one before Gapminder. Oh, the below the line. That one? Below the line? That it? No, gap, no, no. Ah, oh, yeah, got it. Good call, thank you. There it is. Yeah. Selection data visualization with a z.ch for Switzerland. Okay, well thank you very much.